Uh, we are live. Okay. All right. Good. Welcome everybody. Welcome to what's what's this September? Yeah. So welcome to our <laughs> September Healthy Happy Hour for 2020. We told you that we want to continue our Healthy Happy Hour series. Uh, we're not gonna let COVID stop us, though. Um, our usual gatherings have been put on hold, but we back. So I am Joseph Ward, outreach specialist for the Neighborhood Medical Center and the Ryan White Program, and I'm joined by my main man to my left in the screen right here. Tell him who's he. Oh, Matthias Sweet, the Ryan White Program Director for Neighborhood Medical Center. Um, Thank y'all for being out here today. Thank you for bearing with us and with, with everything with COVID and still trying to produce the information. Thank y'all for being a part of this. And it just brings us so much joy that we're able to bring and still do the things that we love doing in person, now virtually, so. Right, right. And we gotta give a special shout out to my man to my far left, the man behind the plan, keeping the things going, Mr. Ian. So we definitely appreciate you, but y'all gotta give Ian a shout out as well. Appreciate you, appreciate you. Thank you, Ian. Ian is our number one IT person who helps us with all of our technical difficulties and just helping keeping us sane during these times when we're trying to do these type of events. So thank you so much, Ian, for being here helping us today. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> this month for Healthy Happy Hour, well, we wanted to hit on the topic that when COVID first was, uh, I guess you could say, an um, uh, issue on a national uh, scale. Some of the information or some of the talks that we heard come out was about domestic violence, uh, domestic and sexual violence, because people feared that the rate of domestic and sexual violence would rise because of the stay, the stay in, uh, what the home and shelter, stay at home shelter order that they had. So um we already knew that being confined in the place with somebody who probably is your main abuser that's not healthy that's not good so that could also that could help increase the rate of domestic violence that we that people are dealing with so we knew that was happening <clears throat> now i look for statistics of, to see if there was an actual uh, recorded rise in the number of domestic violence or a number of sexual violence cases. Now, I didn't see any in my search thus far, but I will continue to look for that. But I do believe, personally, I do believe that there is a, a rise in the, in the number of sexual and domestic violence cases. So before we kind of get into our slides and things, kind of want to ask Matias, so what, what was some of your thoughts when you first heard about uh COVID happening as far as it impacting the ca the number of domestic and sexual violence cases and have you found any information to kind of document the uh a rise in the number of sexual and domestic violence cases well i haven't found any um updated information yet about it because you know as we know data is kind of far behind you know what I'm saying the stuff is that hasn't been reported yet and you're hearing all these different things about shootings and killings and you know, saying fighting and, and these different outbursts because people are just, you know, kind of stuck in a, in a way where they ain't got nothing else to do but be home. But when I first heard COVID and I'm like, they shutting out everything, we in the house, my first mind went to was like these poor kids who are being abused, who are, you know, saying being molested about mm -hmm. the adults who are in a domestic violence situation because now you're trapped in a house, nowhere to go, nowhere to get help from the person who's abusing you at least you had a safe haven to get out for a few moments of the right. day. And just, you know what I'm saying, going through different things and, you know what I'm saying, personal issues in my life, you, you see those different things. And sometimes you don't see those signs that you are truly in a domestic violence situation or that you're being affected by it or your loved one is being affected by it. Because a lot of people don't understand that it could happen to any one of us. It could happen to me, it could happen to you, it could happen to your mom, your brother, your sister. So you never know what somebody's really going through. So that kind of threw me for a loop whenever I saw COVID like we're shutting down, 
nowhere can everybody's got to be home and it's like how are these kids and stuff gonna get their break and if they need help how do they get their way out that was yeah. my main concern yeah because i i think that there has to be a shift in the and our thinking and our tactics as far as pre prevention moving forward especially if it takes us a while to go out of this covid pandemic because we know here in the united states these numbers are not slowing down but that doesn't mean that the number of domestic or sexual violence cases will slow down either. So I do think we have to um, think outside the box, think forward, think think a little broader as far as what are some things that we can do to put in place to help ensure that people have um, outs, if you will, mm -hmm. during this COVID pandemic. Because like you said, if if we stuck in the house together, it's kind of hard for me to get away. So, mm -hmm. All right, so um, we got some PowerPoints that we want to get y'all give to y'all and give give you some information. So um, there's a woman named Carolyn Thomas who is known as the woman without a face, and we're gonna give you her story. I first learned about her on Oprah uh, Internet, the Internet uh, Oprah Show. She was a guest. Um, so this is one of the pictures of Carolyn Thomas after her ordeal and the caption is saying, I would have never thought he would have shot and killed my mother and tried to kill me as well. So, um, this is what Carolyn Thomas looked like in the year 2003. Um, and her mother, Janice Reeves, um both of both her and her mother were victims of the boyfriend Terrence. Um from what I remember from her telling the story, because I actually saw her speak live in 2010, I believe. Um her I don't remember why she said her boyfriend went to prison, but he ended up going to prison. And let's say he was in about a year and three months, year and six months or something like that. But while he was in prison, one of the things that he was telling his cellmate is that he was going to kill his girlfriend, being Carolyn Thomas. And I guess he was dead set on doing it because when he got out and he got a chance to do it, he did. So he got a 44 Magnum gun and he shot Carolyn's mother, I think in the torso area and like the solar plex area, shot and killed her and then shot Carolyn in the face so think about what I'm saying. He's, and he shot this woman in the face with a 44 Magnum gun. We're talking about a huge, powerful handgun. And let's see if we can get this thing to move. All right. Here we go. So this is showing the path or the trajectory of the bullet. So see this, see this handgun being put to the side of her head, her temple area, and, and trigger being pulled. And and, if, and this is showing the, the quarter. So he basically left a, a quarter size entry wound on the side of her head. And as you can see, the length of the bullet. So it's a pretty sizable bullet because it's a pretty sizable handgun. And it left the majority of the front of her face disfigured. So in getting the repair on her face, her right eye had to be repaired well, it's a fake eye now. So all of this, all of this area is like prosthetic. So her eye, her nose, the top lip, uh, the cheekbone on the left side, all of that is prosthetic. Now, one of the one of the things about her is she's definitely a trooper because she had a she had she was in good spirits. This happened to her, but she was still able to um, go on with her life and find happiness and not just dwell on. I guess, or stay in victim mode, I would say. So it says 17 months of surgeries that she endured, um, going back between the doctors, doing what she can to make sure that she repairs herself. And then she became an advocate against domestic violence and started really going back and thinking about the events that happened with her and her boyfriend and um, recognizing what she went past the red flags. So there were signs of him 
being abusive because he was verbally abusive before he was physically abusive. Red flag. If somebody is if somebody is content or hell bent or just comfortable with disrespecting you, ultimate red flag. Flag on the play, 15 yard penalty. No, we can't have that. Right? Because and not recognizing or and not being able to recognize red flags. And that's that's one thing too, is there's some people who ignore red flags, and there's some people who don't know how to recognize red flags. And so one of the things that we're gonna do here today is when we get through this and make sure that we can better recognize red flags. So, um, and that's one of the things Carolyn was talking about is going in, in, in retrospect, okay, this was a red flag, this was a red flag, this was a red flag, but not necessarily being able to truly recognize the red flags while she was in the relationship. So this is her post-surgery. This is her after a number of, what, well, like after a 17 month period, going on with her life. And as I told you, um, the the eye, the face, uh, the nose area, top of the lip area, some of that is prost prosthetic. So, um, and it's not the best as far as the dimensions of the picture, but this is her, like I said, she moved on with her life and she's found a way to find healing for herself, but also help others not be able to go through the situation. So here's another picture of her. So the, one of the main things um, in showing that is making sure that we recognize red flags. We, we don't just ignore red flags. Uh, and you kind of evaluate what's going on truly evaluate what's going on. So you want just so because we don't want uh, any more people becoming victims of domestic and or sexual violence, right? So that's not what we want. We want healthy relationships. So in saying that, we want to shift this a bit to our power and control will and our um, healthy relationship will. And Matthias is going to take us through. So let me bring this PowerPoint up so he can we can get to that. Uh oh, wrong. There we go. All right. You on mute. We're just going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the cycles of violence. So there's pretty much three big stages of violence that we really want to, you know, to bring awareness to because it's a starting point, it's a middle point, and then it's an ending point. And then it's a cycle. It just keeps repeating itself over and over and over again until something bad happens or until the person's able to get out. So the first stage is the tension stage. That's where pretty much it all starts, where people are like the walking around on eggshells. They're, they're you're, you know, the old folks say you're skating on thin ice. You don't know how to tread or talk to somebody or whenever you do something, it's never right enough or it's not good enough. Then they start doing the physical violence part or they actually start with the physical violence part that's bringing it to the head to bring it to the violence. But there's signs, it's just never nothing's good enough. The abuser wants to basically, you know what I'm saying, may not want physical violence, but it just gets to that point to where it becomes physical violence or threatening or they, they start that stage. And then it jumps into the violence. And that's where the violent acts actually happens or the episodes happens, where it includes physical, emotional, sexual abuse and other things also, because a lot of violence can be just, you know, what I'm saying brought on by different things. It could be financial. It could just be different stages where they try to isolate you and just keep you away from everybody else so nobody else sees those different signs. But the violent stage is like the, the second stage, which is a dangerous stage because you could possibly be hurt in this stage. And it is, it's the scary part because you don't really know what's gonna happen next or when that stage is actually gonna end. And that's the fearful part. And that's when a crime is basically committed. Even though you might not think, you know what I'm saying, you hear some young girls, and Joe, tell me if I'm wrong, when we on the set, he blacked my eye, but he loves me. That's how I know he loves yeah. me. That's yeah. the part that gets us no person male to female, female to male, male to male, female to female, transgender, whatever it is, 
Nobody should be laying hands on anybody in a healthy relationship. Right. Nobody should be hitting each other or, you know, you do have arguments, but you got to go through the difference in what an argument is. And they're not trying to beat you down and, and verbally abuse you because there's different forms of violence besides physical. And that's what we want a lot of young women and young men out there to understand. It's different sides to violence than just the the physical part. It's a lot of mental, emotional. Those are the things that play onto in this violence stage. And then after the violence stage comes, you get to that whole the honeymoon stage. Um, and that's where the abuser basically is just a total different person. It just switches over. The episode's over. He's not really trying to say he did anything. He's more remorseful. He's sorry that it's happening. It's just, you know, saying those are the things that goes on to the honeymoon stage where the actual person is basically, you know, saying trying to get over and move on to the past. But that stage, you don't never know at the end of the day when that stage is going to be over with. So he tries to be remorseful, tries to apologize. Oh, I'll never do it again. Or he brings the children into it and try to buy the children's way. So you have to look at those different signs. Um, Joe, what would be your sign to say, what's a good place for them to leave? You've done more sexual violence than I have as far as like teaching and education. Out of this cycle here, what do you think will be the best time for a person to leave? Well, um, to be honest, that's difficult to um, determine within the cycle. And I say that because conditions have to be right for the person to leave. And, um, and what that means is, is there a plan in place? Is there support in place? Um, are there resources in place? Um, because there is danger. So let's say if somebody leaves during the violent stage, how violent are the actions um, before and how violent can the actions get? Because we all know that verbal abuse can turn into physical abuse um, pretty quickly, especially if somebody's somebody's trying to get out of the situation. And uh, I guess the person that's trying to exert their power of control is trying to maintain if i'm trying to maintain dominance if you leave i can't maintain dominance over nobody so i need you to stay so i can maintain the dominance but um i would say somebody can leave at any point of the cycle it just they need their resources in place and if they don't have their plan and their resources in place it's going to be difficult for them to leave i'm not going to say it's impossible but it makes it more difficult for them to leave Okay, so it's a personal choice on the person when they feel more comfortable to leave. Yeah, yeah, when the conditions are, are right, yeah. Okay, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So that was just the, basically the cycle of violence on how it breaks down. So now we're going to break down more into the actual power and control wheel. So it does say physical, violence, sexual. So which is using the intimidation stage is basically where it starts. And that's where he kind of makes the person feel afraid. He's trying to be in control. He's trying to have all the power where he just basically just smashes things, destroy. He basically tries to make you feel fearful for yourself so you don't leave. So you actually are more, I don't even want to say the word empowered, but you're more to use him and utilize him as the, the, the authoritative figure. And that's where that imitation, the using imitation comes from. The next stage will be the using the emotional abuse. So that's basically putting you down, telling you that you're not good enough, that you're fat, that you're ugly. You don't look like this. Um, he tries to just to make you feel bad mentally and physically and emotionally, just trying to just, you know, what I'm saying play mind games with you. He's just trying to get into your head and mess with your emotions. Then he uses the isolation stage, which is the next stage, where he tries to bring you away from all your friends. Now, if you are a person that's like myself and Joe, you're kind of sociable, you like to go out, do things. He's trying to bring you away from all that, where it's just basically closing off your circle to where it's just you and him. So now you're depending on him and him only. You haven't talked to your friends in months, years. So this process could go on for a while. It's not a quick process all the time where it goes. These different stages could go for years and months and people don't even know that they're in those stages because for somebody to isolate you, they're cutting you off from everybody. 
So basically they're just cutting you off and now your only lifeline, your only support, your only everything is that one person, which isn't healthy. So that's when the isolation stays. So they make you feel like there's nothing else to do. Um, all you can do is talk to them, console with them. Um, they limit you going different places and involving with people. And just that's just not healthy. And that's what we want people to understand. Don't never just limit yourself just to one person. Then we have the, the, the minimizing and denying and the blaming. We're basically, we're making light of the abuse and not always um, being upfront about it or just making excuses for them. And just, you know, saying those are the things or I hit you because, you know, what I'm saying trying to make them feel that they did something so wrong that it vowed for them to get beat up or to get talked to like that or get shamed or however it was that behavior. So just shifting the responsibility for the abuse to the behavior, you know, what I'm saying to, to abuse the behavior. So those are the things that we're looking for. Sometimes and the next thing, sometimes they use the children trying to make um, the person feel guilty about, you know what I'm saying, about the children or using them to kind of relay messages, putting the children into a, a place where a child should never be. A child should never have to come through two adults to make any type of communication or anything as far as like what's going on in your relationship. That's the number one red flag. So, and I guess old school people would always go back and say too as well, Joe, is, Everybody who you date does not need to meet your children. Everybody who yeah. you date does not need to get into yeah. everything. So if you're in the dating world, be very careful on who you are choosing to bring around your children because you never know what those people's intentions are. You know what I'm saying? So the, the violence could maybe not even turn to you. It could turn to your ch children. Yeah. So those are the things that you got to be careful about as well when you have children and being in a relationship with some men or some women. Then the next step was be using the male privilege, making him feel like he's superior, like he is the one, you know what I'm saying? Making you do all the different chores or being like a servant to him. Those are some signs that you really want to, you know, just look at and be like, you know, I don't think this works for me. Um, you know what I'm saying? Just making you feel like you have to answer to every becking call. Or if you don't answer the phone when he calls, those are the things he's trying to use his male privilege or his authoritative figureness to really bring about, you know, saying control over you. And then there's going to the next stage is the economic abuse. So when you do that, he's trying to, most men who are controlling want to know you every whereabouts. They want to know why you spending this. You got to ask me for the money. If you want money, you need to ask me for it. Or you can't work here or, or I don't want you working this to make this money because I need to feel like I'm control and superior. I'm the man. I need to make more than the woman. I need he has those control and that's what he's trying to use money to gain. And that's why we say there's different types of abuse because nobody should be able to be controlled and have those type of things dangled in front of them. If they need groceries or food, you shouldn't have to ask every single time I need to get money to go here. You see what I'm saying? Right. So we really want people to understand that part. And then using coercion or threats to end the whole process is basically where he's taking control trying to make you know what I'm saying make you feel or try to bring hurt or harm to you by doing something because he's threatening he's trying to i'm going to do this i'm going to do that i'm going to if you leave i'm going to kill you or are you going to you know what I'm saying those are the things that we're trying to make sure that we try to avoid because making um just making her drop changes. Like, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Just doing different things to be in a threatening situation, coercion. He's just trying to make you do whatever he wants you to do to be in those stages. And that could cause a lot of problems. So that's the whole power and control wheel in itself when it comes to the negative as far as like the violent stages. Joe, did I leave anything out? No. Um, now, one one thing I would add to economic abuse, just kind of stress a little more. I, I ain't gonna say add, but stress a little more is um, the person who's seeking the power and control doesn't want the other person to make more money than them, because money equals power. And how can I maintain power and control 
if you got power. So just kind of keep that in mind that you have people in these relationships who they think little of themselves. They have low self-esteem on their end. They don't love themselves. And a good way for somebody in that position to feel better about themselves is to make you feel worse about yourself than they feel about them. So you will be there, you'll become the ego booster. And if I need somebody else to make me feel good about me, if I need you to feel bad about you to make me feel good about me, then I'm in a bad place and I'm not ready to be in a relationship. And so, and, and remember, it's nobody's job to save nobody or make nobody change or make nobody or to help somebody become better. Like, well, I'm not gonna say you can't help somebody. You can't help somebody, but I have to be ready. I have to want change. You can't want change for me more than I want change for me. You're right. Right. Because because then then you're trying to you're trying to convince somebody to do what you think is best for them. Even though it might be, it might be something that's good for them or best for them at the time. But if I'm not ready to receive, if I'm not ready to move, if I'm not ready to get to the next level, if I want to be in this specific place in my life, now you got a decision to make. You're either gonna be here with me in this place that I'm stuck or you not. Right. And you have to do what's best for you. But it's not, it's nobody's job to try to convince or make somebody become a better person. And um, the reason why I'm saying that because in a lot of these uh, relationships that are unhealthy relationships, because remember, it's not even just about uh, physical violence. It's emotional violence, it's verbal violence, it's all the things that, he, that Matija just covered in the wheel. So just remembering that, like, you can't make nobody a better person. You can help somebody help themselves right. become a better person, but you can't make nobody a better person. You're right. So, um, so we got one more slide, one more PowerPoint that we're going to get into with you all. Uh, what happened to my thing? All right, here we go. All right. All right. All right. So this is this is just information about sexual and dating violence, but it's it's domestic and sexual violence. Um, and I keep saying se sexual violence because we're talking about uh, molestations, rapes, uh, har sexual harassment, things in that realm. Uh, they happen a lot. Um, within the within the various communities and once again with covid being present it could lead to an increase in the number of instances that people will experience sexual violence as well as domestic or dating violence so um so quick definition sexual violence is the unwanted sexual actions and words that are harmful to another person so terms that are associated with the sexual violence and sexual abuse or sexual assault. Um, legally, it'll be sexual battery. So uh, when you see people get caught up, um, charged, get battery charges, that means, that usually means some kind of physical violence happened. Um, sexual coercion, as Matias just talked about, is forcing someone to submit to an unwanted sexual act by intimidation, threatening people, manipulating people, using words and actions, using your power to make somebody do what you want them to do. So an example is, I'm a teacher, you a student. I think you look good as a student and you come to me because you need help. Uh, you want to know how you can raise your grade. And I say, well, if you want an A, you can give me some A. That's the example of courage. And so, and if the student gives in, you can't just, I know some people will say, well, the student grown, the student didn't have to. The student was intimidated into doing that because especially if that student needs that grade for a specific reason, because it can't be the student who don't care about their grades. It's the student who needs the grade, that care about their grade. That's the way the intimidation can work. So right. we have to be able to understand that. Other, other forms of sexual violence is child sexual abuse or incest. And a lot of states, not all states, but in a lot of states in the United States, Incest is illegal. Um, child pornography. Child pornography is a form of sexual violence. Uh, 
any uh, and I'll tell you this, anybody who especially spread this to anybody you know under the age 18. If you're under the age of 18 and you have pictures of yourself or somebody else under the age of 18 in your phone that are new, that would be considered child pornography. And like I said, whether they're pictures of yourself or others, that would be considered child pornography. Anybody under the age of 18. Um, so uh, commercial sexual exploitation, paying for strippers, paying for sex. Uh, those are situations that increase the likelihood of sexual violence. Uh, professional sexual exploitation is inappropriate use of sexual actions by professionals. So perpetrators, anybody could be a perpetrator. Does this have a picture? No. Uh, so a picture I had in here, y'all remember the movie uh, Pulp Fiction? Mm-hmm. All right. So you remember the scene where uh, Mel Gibson and um, Vin Raines were, they got locked in the basement with the old dude with the tight leather suit and he was oiling people up. Mm -hmm. And so why I use that scene because Vin Raines not a small dude. Vin Raines a big, strong dude. Right. But right. the older guy, the old man was able to rape Vin Raines because he was able to subdue him, tie him down, restrain him. So in that form, he was able to gain power as the perpetrator. Um, another example is I was watching the TV show, What Would You Do? With that Robert Keonis dude or whatever his name is. And they had a, they had a fake scenario set up, but there's something that can be real as well. But they had a young lady, let's say the young lady, five foot four, 120 pounds. And then she was on the date with the dude about six, eight, 300 pounds. The big dude went to the bathroom or the scenario, he went to the bathroom and while he's going to the bathroom, she slipped something in his drink. People saw uh, part of the scenarios, people saw that. But when he came back, nobody said, hey, don't drink the drink. They watched him drink the drink. He drank it and pretended to be in inebriated. Uh, but I use that scenario because you had a small woman, five foot four, 120 pounds, who was able to subdue a man, six, seven, three hundred pounds. So perpetrators can be anybody. It's not just somebody who's big and strong and burly who look like they just take stuff. It could be anybody who has a way of getting an advantage over somebody. So a victim, in that in that sense, a victim can be anybody. A victim can be six, seven, three hundred pounds. A victim can be five, four hundred twenty pounds. A victim can be young. A victim can be old. A victim can be strong, weak, rich, poor. So anybody can become a victim. Now, that's not to say to walk around afraid, but walk around knowledgeable about what's going on, because a lot of times somebody who is not perceived to uh, become victimized won't be believed if they are victimized. So, um, the media has done a good job of giving us sexual messages with no context. Um, we know that our kids and just us period can learn a, or, or be miseducated a lot about sex and become over sex just through what we consume through the media. I mean, let's just be real. One of the, let's, the song now, W-A-P, right? <laughs> let's just be real. We know, like, uh, the adults know what that song is about, right? And but bo both of those ladies, even though that's not all they do, but both of those ladies are associated with a lot of sexual rap. So um, a lot of the celebrities and the things that we consume is sexualized, it's sex here, sex there, sex, sex everywhere. So one of the longstanding things is how men are socialized and sexualized through the media. So we, we are talking about a patriarchal system, a country that's built on patriarchy. So men rule, men rule, men rule. And then you over-sexualize the men and you and you miseducate the men on what sex and sexuality is. And so in turn, you have women who become uh, miseducated and over-sexualized. So we, now we have both men and women who are affected by the, the messages in the media. And I know this in this slide is, is geared toward men 
But if we be real about our society, in order for something to become a a, a part of a culture, in order for something to with to withstand the, t the test of time and to last in the culture, it has to be accepted by more than just one side. So men can't just accept patriarchy for patriarchy to exist. Women have to buy into it as well. And that doesn't mean you don't have any opposition, but that does mean it's been brought into by both sides. So here's some, here's some images that we would see. So you flip into a magazine, you're just trying to buy some pants. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I don't have to be oversexed to buy no pants. We live in no, well, we live in the South. Let it get 60 degrees. I'm putting my hoodie on and I need some good pants. I don't need to be oversexed to get me some pants. But that, that's the kind of things that we see. And we see it's it has women in subservient positions as well. So it's not necessarily showing women as human beings, but more sexual objects. And you're going to have a lot of these magazines, you'll have women buying these magazines, or you have guys who are into this fashion. If you wear Dolce and Gabbana, if you wear Calvin Klein, all those things there, you know, hey, do your thing. But you are being subliminally impacted by these images that you're coming across. So we have this Sky Vodka ad and then this Newport ad. And they, they, they pushing a the limit in these, right? So Sky Vodka, you see the guy, you see the man with, Standing over the woman in a, in a in a position of dominance with his crotch over her, and the way she's positioned is you see her breast. So she is reduced to her breast and being in a subservient position close to his crotch. So basically, she's not even human, and she only good for one thing. Basically, that's what it's telling you. But oh yeah, but drinks got vodka as well. Then we have the Newport ad. You know that's what they're saying. Then we got the Newport ad. Like, come on, put your mind in the gutter when you look at this. Like, come on, man, really? They have the water hole just blasting off all in them ladies' mouth. Like, come on. And so, but you also have to look at the language on alive with pleasure, Newport. So remember that the idea has been already put in our minds, especially those of us who I would say grew up in the 80s and, and before that. Um, we, we would see on TV and in movies that after people will have sex, they smoke a cigarette, right? So after all, if if smoking isn't a pleasure, why bother? So they associate smoking with pleasure. They associate so smoking with sexual pleasure. You can see the sexual pleasure because, like I say, you have the water hose on and it's going in the lady's mouth. So we see that sexual ads. So these are these are women who have been over sexualized right so let's start the picture at the bottom as far as i know she was one of the first women in the rap game who was open about having the fake butt so i forgot what her name and angel lola angela lola whatever she was hot when the g unit was hot she was in like all their videos or something like that and so um she was the little small girl with big old butt and then it came out she had the small well she had the fake butt and I ain't gonna say she made it popular, but she was one of the first ones that brought it to the mainstream or who revealed it in the mainstream. And then we know how Kim Kardashian became famous. Uh, her and Ray J and they little movie that they had. <laughs> yeah. um, Rihanna has just, Rihanna hasn't gone to the uh, extent of these two ladies, but she has been sexualized by the industry. And I ain't gonna lie, I've been caught up into it too because there have been times when I've looked at Rihanna just as an object. So we, we it's, it's, it's work. And then you can see in this picture, they got a touch in the crotch. So sexualization of women is there. Men are sexualized as well, but we're used to, and we, we see more of the sexualization of, of women. And so um, getting into a quick violence, dating violence things, um, Matias kind of covered this, but just reiterate. Any behavior by a dating partner, which is used to, like you say, manipulate, control, lower self-esteem, intentionally scare, harm, or isolate. If relationships are give and take, relationships are about compromise. Um, there might be something you're good at and then something I'm good at, right? Mm -hmm. Let's play to our strengths. I have a different style, you have a different style. It's not our job, either one of our job is 
to, to dominate each other. We're not here to dominate each other. We're here to complement each other. Right, right. I bring my 100%, you bring your 100%. And how can we help each other become, how can we help each other help ourselves? Let's think, think about it like that. How are we helping each other help ourselves? Because like I said earlier, if I don't want to get better, you can want all you want. I ain't getting better because I don't want to get better. So it's about compromise. It's about understanding where you are and being in love with yourself, being comfortable with yourself, liking yourself, um, having an understanding of who you are and where you are, what you want out of life. So being able to understand that. Um, once you get that information, you will, or uh, once you, once you really um, embrace that, embrace yourself, you will be able to recognize a lot of signs and not just go past the, the red flag signs, but be able to recognize them and assess whether you want to go forward in that relationship or not. Um, admit, did it throw us off? Are we good? We good. Okay. Anything you want to add to that? I know the PowerPoint went away. Um, just making sure that you know, saying as young, young or old or middle aged um, individuals in the dating game, or even in some relationships, because some relationships could be everything that glitters isn't always gold. So everything that happens at first, it might seem like it's going good. These signs could pop up later, and especially dealing with COVID right now we really want people to understand that people mindsets are not always in the best of places at this time because you you got a lot of people who lost their jobs who, who's going through things who's you know saying life isn't normal anymore as me and joe always say we're living in our new now and not yep. the new normal because it's a now we nobody has ever been through COVID 19 pandemic before this is something new we're all going through this together so people's mental health is being you know, saying affected by this, people's emotions, relationships, things are getting tight. When people lose their job, their money becomes tight. And now they weren't able to afford the things that they're able to afford. So that puts them in different moods and things like that. So we got to look and be able to seek for help and assistance when we know how. Some things that I really want people to um, know and understand is that you know saying there is help out there for you you can call neighborhood medical center we can try to assist you with resources big ben 211 is a great resource for everybody to go out and get the information they need you can call them 24 hours a day big ben 211 it's a hotline and you tell them what's going on and they can tell you every resource you need at that point in time that you can get to um the refuge house always you know saying those are the things for children we like to um have you, you know, saying look at those places that have them little big triangle um, octagon shapes in their windows saying safe places. There are people here that can help you. And we just really want people to understand and know that there is help out there for you. We just have to be able to get you to the things that you're able to get to. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, make sure you contact local resources. I know here Refuge House is one of the main resources. Um, there's a domestic violence hotline. Um, you can Google. Make sure you find your local resources. Make sure you you um, reach out to different people. If you need counseling, get, get yourself some counseling. If you need any type of help, don't be afraid to get it. So, um, yeah, make sure you take care of yourself. Make Please make sure you take care of yourself. Um, so with that being said, we got to wrap this thing up. And we appreciate you all for tuning in for another healthy, happy hour. So we'll be back next month. Um, I forgot what we were supposed to go into next month. I think some more dental stuff. Dental and HIV. So that's what we got going on next month. We hope you all enjoy this. We hope you all learned something today and gave you information that you can use. So with that being said, I am Joseph Ward. He's T Sweet. Appreciate you, Ian. This is Healthy Happy Hour from Neighborhood Medical Center. We'll see y'all next time. All right. Yeah, take it easy. Thank you.